Well, good morning, everyone. So I'm the lecture between you and lunch, so we'll get started. So as we go through this, um, well, before, I'll give you a little visual break. This is uh, Boulder Beach. Any thoughts where this is? Anyone know? South Africa, I think I heard that. So as we go through this talk today, um, I'd like you to be able to identify the diagnostic criteria for primary and secondary amenorrhea and to develop a framework for evaluating patients with um, both of these conditions. <clears throat> this is a diagram that you probably are all familiar with, but I thought it's worth reviewing. So this is the HPO axis. So the hypothalamus produces gonadotropin-releasing hormone, or GR, GNRH, which stimulates the anterior pituitary to produce follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. And these hormones, in turn, stimulate the ovary to produce estrogen and progesterone. Estrogen and progesterone stimulate the um, production of the uterine lining and also have a negative and a positive feedback effect on the anterior pituitary and the hypothalamus. So this is kind of the base. As we go through our talk about amenorrhea, I'm going to categorize where the problems are occurring um, according to if they are a central problem happening at the level of the hypothalamus or the anterior pituitary, or is this a problem at the level of the ovary, or is it an end organ problem? This is a diagram that you probably recall from medical school. Um, and just to review it, uh, the menstrual cycle is divided into three phases, the follicular phase, ovulation, and the luteal phase. During the first portion of the follicular phase, um, menstruation is occurring, levels of estrogen are very low, and this actually has a positive effect on FSH. So the follicle-stimulating hormone uh, stimulates final maturation of the follicle within the ovary. As the phase progresses, the levels of estrogen rise, and this causes the lining of the uterus to become more vascular and thicker. As levels of estrogen rise towards the end of the follicular phase, this triggers a luteinizing hormone surge. And this LH surge is what triggers ovulation. Um, once ovulation occurs, the remnants of the follicle known as the corpus luteum produce estrogen and progesterone. And it's under the influence of both estrogen and progesterone that the endometrial lining becomes even more thick and more vascular. Um, and if fertilization of the egg occurs, this provides a very hospitable environment um, in which the egg can implant. Now, if fertilization does not occur, the corpus luteum will involute within 14 days Levels of estrogen and progesterone will fall off precipitously. The endometrium will no longer be able to be maintained. Um, it will become necrotic and slough off in what's known as menstruation. So just keep in mind that if ovulation does not occur, a corpus luteum is not formed uh, and progesterone is not produced. And this you will see will be key in some conditions that cause amenorrhea. So just a few facts about menarche. The mean age for menarche is 12 and a half years, but the range can be anywhere from nine to 16 years of age. Typically menarche occurs one year after peak growth velocity and two years after the onset of breast buds. Um, usually, girls who are going through menarche have achieved TANR4 um, for both breasts and pubic hair. And by menarche, most girls have completed 75% of their pubertal development, and they have achieved 90% of their growth potential.
The early menstrual cycles tend to be anovulatory. So ovulation actually reflects synchronization and maturation of the HPO access that we just reviewed. Girls who go through menarche at an earlier age, let's say 11, they tend to achieve um, regular cycles sooner than girls who go through menarche late, let's say age 13 or 14. It may take these girls several years to achieve regular cycles. Cycles can vary in length anywhere from 21 to 45 days. So that's day one of one period to day one of the next period. Uh, duration can range anywhere from two to seven days. And average blood loss is between 30 and 40 milliliters. So let's review some of the definitions for primary amenorrhea. So the first is, absence of menarche by age 15 years in a girl with otherwise normal growth and development. So otherwise normal pubertal growth and development. Secondly, the absence of menarche, breast development, and pubic hair by the age of 13 years. So this would be a young lady who so shows no signs of pubertal development. Next, the failure to undergo menarche within three years of thelarche. So if a young girl develops breast buds at the age of 10, but by age 13 she hasn't, has not undergone menarche, this would qualify. And then lastly, the absence of menarche by the age of 14 years with any of the following concerns. So a young lady, that's, that's her suit. One who you have concerns um, is exercising excessively or may have an eating disorder. Or someone with um, a suspected genital outflow tract obstruction or anomaly. These girls should be evaluated for primary amenorrhea. Secondary amenorrhea is defined as the absence of menses for greater than three months in a female with previously well-established menstruation. So now that we have these definitions under our belts, let's go through the etiology of amenorrhea. Um, I have elected to categorize these problems according to where along the HPO axis that they are occurring. And the first one is constitutional delay of puberty. This is um, a condition which is actually more common in boys than in girls, but it can happen in girls as well. Usually there is a family history of late bloomers. So usually these individuals um, are short during childhood. They might be tracking along the fifth percentile. And then they usually go through puberty late and they ultimately um, achieve a normal adult height. They can have a delayed bone age and this condition is a diagnosis of exclusion. Next on the list is something known as Kalman syndrome. In Kalman syndrome, there's a failure of gonadotropin releasing hormone cells to migrate from around the olfactory area to the hypothalamus during fetal development. So these girls do not produce GnRH. Along with um, failure to produce this hormone, they may have anosmia, so lack of smell, and they could have other midline defects, such as a cleft palate, a cleft lip, um, or color blindness. And oftentimes, this condition does not come to light until um, a young lady fails to go through puberty, so no one realizes that she can't smell. Uh, isolated GnRH insufficiency is similar to Kalman syndrome, but there's no lack of smell. Now there's a whole category of chronic diseases that can result um, in suppression of GnRH, and this includes inflammatory bowel disease, cystic fibrosis, lupus, and type 1 diabetes. Um, inflammatory bowel disease in particular can sometimes present as nothing more than a failure to grow. So um, a girl or a guy falling off of their growth curves. So this is something to keep in mind. Other categories of hypothalamic problems include nutritional problems, anorexia nervosa, bulimia, or obesity. Rigorous exercise, 
uh, should be a red flag. There's something known as the female athlete triad that's um, characterized by amenorrhea, disordered eating, and low bone density. And oftentimes you'll see this in long distance runners. Um, you could also, you really could see it in any, um, in any athlete, gymnasts, ballet dancers. Stress, significant stress can also cause amenorrhea. Substance abuse, particularly cocaine, which can cause elevated levels of prolactin. And other medications, including atypical antipsychotics, such as risperidol, and then um, various antidepressants, such as SSRIs, MAO inhibitors, and tricyclic antidepressants. All of these um, medications can raise prolactin levels, which have a suppressive effect on gonadotropin-releasing hormone. And then um, any tumor of the hypothalamus can also cause amenorrhea. So moving on to pituitary disorders. Um, first is a, a benign tumor known as a prolactinoma. So prolactinomas cause elevated levels of prolactin, as the name would suggest. Um, and in addition to that, they can cause galacteria or nipple discharge. Craniopharyngiomas are also tumors of the, of the pituitary that can encroach on the pituitary stalk and also cause some visual field defects. There's idiopathic hypopituitarism, where um, the individual just fails to produce any of the pituitary hormones, such as LH, FSH, ACTH, or TSH. And any history of a CNS infection, such as meningitis during childhood, uh, can affect the pituitary. Moving on to ovarian disorders. Um, and the first thing I have listed is gonadal dysgenesis. And gonadal dysgenesis is any problem that causes um, failure of the ovary to develop. So Turner syndrome is actually a form of gonadal dysgenesis. But you could also have gonadal dysgenesis with a normal karyotype, such as 46XX. There's also something known as Sewer syndrome, um, 46XY, and then of course, Turner syndrome. So I took this course about, I think it was three years ago, and I know that Turner syndrome came up in everybody's talk. So you're probably well familiar with this, but just allow me to reiterate. So girls with Turner syndrome tend to have short stature, web neck, um, wide, widely spaced nipples, shield chest. They may have um, cardiac defects, such as coarctation of the aorta, and they may also have uh, renal, renal defects. Um, there is a form of Turner syndrome known as mosaic Turners, and in this condition, the girls may have some cell lines that are 45XO, but um, other cell lines are, 40, are normal, 46XX. These girls uh, may have, their ovaries may be functional enough that they may develop secondary sexual characteristics, so they go through puberty, they may start to menstruate, but usually over time, their kidneys will involute and they will ultimately develop amenorrhea. Another condition, polycystic ovary syndrome. Polycystic ovary syndrome, we really don't know the cause of it, but we do think it has something to do with insulin resistance. There's a number of uh, organizations that have attempted to define polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, you may have, the girls may have cysts on their ovaries, although this is somewhat controversial. They usually have elevated androgen levels and they have amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea. And this is actually one of the most common causes of secondary amenorrhea. Any form of ovarian failure can result in amenorrhea, such as infection or a history of chemotherapy or radiation as a child. Um, autoimmune disease can result in amenorrhea. And then um, idiopathic 
premature ovarian failure. So this is ovarian failure, this is going through menopause before the age of 40. Moving on to structural or end organ defects. So following Turner syndrome, this is the second most common cause of primary uh, amenorrhea. So any sort of genital tract obstruction can result in amenorrhea, something such as an imperforate hymen or a vaginal septum. Usually, the, usually these girls will have a cyclic abdominal pain. So they are menstruating, but it's just not able to be released. Asherman syndrome is a condition where there has been scarification of the lining of the uterus. This usually uh, follows a DNC. So there's an endometritis that occurs that causes severe scarring of the lining of the um, uterus and there's just the inability to lay down an endometrial lining. Moving on to malarian agenesis. Malarian agenesis is a condition where a young lady um, has the absence of a vagina. She has a normal karyotype, 46XX, but the um, vagina is absent. Usually there is an absent cervix in uterus as well, although pieces and parts might be present. She does have ovaries though, so she does go through puberty at a normal time, but she just fails to menstruate. And this is in contrast to androgen insensitivity syndrome. In this scenario, um, the individual has a karyotype of 46XY. However, because of the lack of androgen receptors, these individuals appear phenotypically female. They tend to be tall, statuesque females with large breasts and minimal axillary or pubic hair. Um, they also have intra-abdominal or inguinal testes, which should be removed around the time of puberty because there is a potential for malignant transformation. Um, and in these individuals, their vagina ends in a blind pouch. Other etiologies for amenorrhea include pregnancy. That's actually the number one cause of secondary amenorrhea. <clears throat> um, hormonal contraception, particularly Depo-Provera. It may take um, six to 12 months for a young lady to regain regular menses after stopping Depo. And any of the following endocrinopathies uh, can result in amenorrhea, so diabetes, Thyroid, thyroid disease or adrenal disease, such as Cushing's disease or congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is um, a 21 hydroxylase deficiency. So how to evaluate for amenorrhea? As with all, as with everything in medicine, we wanna start with a good history. So it's very important to um, inquire about pubertal growth and development. When did the young lady develop breast buds, pubic hair? Um, when did she go through her growth spurt? You wanna pay particular attention to that. You wanna inquire about any possibility of systemic disease. We talked earlier about inflammatory bowel disease, for instance. You wanna ask about a family history of either delayed puberty um, or systemic disease. When did mother and sisters go through menarche? That's important information. You want to inquire about environmental stress, any, hil any history of psychiatric illness, and is this individual any medications, any possibility of drug abuse. You want to ask about diet. This is very important. If you have any suspicions of disordered eating, you really want to try to gather a sense of what is this young lady's relationship with food and what is her body image. Um, I, I find it helpful to take a 24-hour diet history because I think it's probably the best way to flush out what this individual is eating. And I also ask about, are there any foods you won't eat? Um, 
You want to ask about exercise habits? Again, very important, and be very, very specific. How often are you exercising? How long are you exercising? You want to inquire about a change in weight, either weight gain or weight loss. In private, you want to ask, you want to inquire about a sexual history. It is possible to um, become pregnant if you've never had a period, so long as you um, have gone through, otherwise you've developed other secondary sexual characteristics. You want to inquire about a history of any androgen excess. Has this young lady suddenly developed acne? Um, has she become more hirsute? Um, has she noticed that her voice has deepened? Anything like that. And then you want to inquire about galactorrhea. So has she noticed any uh, nipple discharge? Moving on to physical exam. Very important to pay attention to vital signs. For instance, you want to look at heart rate. Is there any evidence of tachycardia, which you might see with hyperthyroidism, or bradycardia, which might be evident with um, an eating disorder? Um, check blood pressure. You want, it's very important that you look at growth curves. Has this young lady suddenly fallen off her growth curve, particularly as it relates to her weight? Um, you want to assess her sexual maturity rating for breasts and pubic hair. You want to look at her overall body habitus. For instance, girls with Cushing syndrome tend to have a lot of truncal obesity and may have a very prominent abdominal stria. And then you want to look for any signs of hirsutism or virilization. On exam, you want to carefully palpate her thyroid her abdomen, looking for a gravid uterus, and her groin, looking for inguinal testes. You want to do a thorough breast exam, looking for um, any nipple discharge or galactorrhea. It's very important to do um, a genital exam. You want to ex inspect the external genitalia for any signs of clitoromegaly. You want to look to see if the um, vagina has been estrogenized as evidenced by a more, dark, a more dark red color as opposed to the bright red color that you see in prepubertal girls. And then if possible, you want to do a pelvic exam. At the very least, you want to document the presence of a patent vagina. So if this is a virginal patient, um, at the very least, you would want to insert a moistened Q-tip. You should be able to insert it between um, seven to eight centimeters, just to document the presence of a patent vagina. On neuro exam, you want to do uh, check cranial nerves, looking for, looking for anything such as hearing loss, which you can see with some conditions, and also checking visual fields. On laboratory exam, there's a whole laundry list of things that we can get, and we'll go through this more specifically when we look at um, specific scenarios. So these are a list of things one might get. This is a picture of the Cape of Good Hope in South Africa if you've ever wondered what it looked like. Okay, question number one. A 12-year-old female gymnast presents with lack of pubertal development. She is Tanner 1 for breast development and pubic hair and has not undergone menarche. Height and weight are at the 10th percentile. Family history reveals that her mother and sister were late bloomers and underwent menarche at age 15 years. Her history and physical exam are all within normal limits. So diagnoses to consider include inflammatory bowel disease, excessive exercise, constitutional delay of puberty, or all of the above. Okay, and the correct answer is actually D, all of the above. So we know that um, certainly constitutional delay of puberty can present um, as such, but so can excessive exercise and so can infl inflammatory bowel disease. So the correct answer is all of the above.
Okay, so we're going to segue into how to tackle amenorrhea with delayed puberty. This is an over overwhelming slide, so don't worry. We're going to break this down into its component parts. Okay, so first we want to gather a very good history and do a thorough physical exam. If everything checks out, a good place to start is with a CBC and a SED rate, looking for any forms of chronic disease, uh, thyroid function studies, looking for thyroid problems, a prolactin level, looking for a prolactinoma, and if all of that checks out, a bone age, looking for constitutional delay of growth. So for chronic disease, we might see anemia and an elevated SED rate in hypothyroidism, elevated TSH and low T4. With a prolactinoma, a significantly elevated um, prolactin level. If you get a prolactin level that's just kind of a little elevated, I would recheck it. And caution the young lady to not examine her breasts or if she showers that morning to just leave her breasts alone because that certainly can um, cause an elevation in the prolactin level. But if it's considerably elevated, proceed with an MRI of the head to look for a prolactinoma. And as I said, if all other labs are no normal, you can check a bone age, and if it's delayed, then you are dealing with constitutional delay of puberty. But if all of these things are normal, then you need to dig further. So you want to check um, an FSH and an LH level. So you want to differentiate. Is this a problem that is occurring centrally at the level of the hypothalamus or pituitary, or is this a problem with the ovary? So you check your FSH and your LH, and you find that it's very elevated. So it looks like the hypothalamus and the pituitary are doing their job, but for some reason, the ovary is not responding. The best way to sort this out is with a karyotype. If you check a karyotype, you will find that in Turner syndrome and in many forms of gonadal dysgenesis, it will be abnormal. However, you will find a normal karyotype in these forms of ovarian failure, such as autoimmune ovaritis, um, if there's a history of radiation or chemotherapy, or something known as resistant ovary syndrome. So let's say you check the, um, the FSH and LH, and they're normal. Well, you could consider getting an MRI of the head to look for a CNS lesion but in most cases, you are dealing with some form of chronic disease or more likely an eating disorder, excessive exercise, or psychosocial stress. So those are um, very common reasons for delayed puberty. So question two, the study most likely to be abnormal in constitutional delay of puberty is? This is easy. Right, bone age. Question three. A 14-year-old female presents for evaluation of primary amenorrhea. On exam, you notice that she has Tanner 1 for breasts and pubic hair and less than the fifth percentile for height. Physical exam also reveals a web neck, widely spaced nipples, and a low hairline. The best study to confirm your diagnosis is LH, karyotype, TSH, or bone age. Good. And what does this young lady most likely have? Turner syndrome. Okay, question four. A 15-year-old female presents with a two-month history of amenorrhea, fatigue, and dizziness. Menarche began at age 12, and menses have previously been regular. Physical exam is normal, including tan or four breast and pubic hair. The most important initial study would be Luteinizing hormone, 
progesterone challenge, pregnancy test, or prolactin level? Correct. So pregnancy test. So any young lady who has secondary sexual characteristics, if, be, if she has primary or secondary amenorrhea, pregnancy test should always be your first test. So with that, we're going to um, tackle amenorrhea with normal pubertal development. Again, a very busy slide, but we'll break it down. So we're going to begin with um, a very good history and physical exam. And this physical exam would include you know, inspection of the external genitalia as well as the pelvic exam. And again, if you are not able to clearly establish the pre presence of a patent vagina and a cervix, then you need to proceed with a pelvic ultrasound. But let's say you check, um, you do a complete physical exam, including pelvic exam, and everything appears to be normal. Your first test is a pregnancy test, followed by a TSH and prolactin. And if that's normal, then we're going to proceed with a progesterone challenge. And a progesterone challenge will let us know if this young lady is producing adequate estrogen on her own. So if, and a progesterone challenge um, is Provera or Medroxyprogesterone, 10 milligrams once a day, anywhere from seven to 10 days. Then once this course of um, Medroxyprogesterone is complete, you should see withdrawal bleeding within two to three days. And if you do, that lets you know that this young lady is producing adequate estrogen and most likely she is failing to ovulate as we see in polycystic ovary syndrome. If there's no withdrawal bleeding, then you proceed with an estrogen and progesterone challenge. So that's usually two weeks of both estrogen and progesterone, and then once it's stopped, you should see a response. If there's no response, you wonder about Asherman syndrome, which you'll recall is scarification of the uterine lining, or some form of outlet obstruction, maybe a very high vaginal septum that you may have overlooked. If you have a positive response to your estrogen and progesterone challenge, then move on to um, looking at FSH and LH. Once again, you want to know um, why the ovary is not responding. So you check a karyotype to see if you're dealing with something like Turner mosaic or a mixed gonadal dysgenesis, or perhaps a form of ovarian failure, which would be seen both with elevated levels of FSH and LH. If the LH and FSH levels are normal or low, once again, you can consider an MRI of the head if there's any concerns for a CNS lesion, but more likely you're dealing with one of these group of um, issues, either chronic disease, eating disorder, excessive exercise, or psychosocial stress. This is actually a very common cause for secondary amenorrhea. So question five. A 16-year-old female runner presents to your office with a 12-month history of secondary amenorrhea. The patient states that in an effort to improve her athletic performance, she lost 20 pounds by eating more healthy. Exam reveals a very thin female with a height at the 50th percentile. Weight has fallen from the 25th percentile one year ago to less than the 5th percentile. The study most likely to be abnormal is prolactin, MRI of the head, TSH, or bone density. Good, and the answer is bone density. What, what condition does this young lady have? Female athlete triad. So amenorrhea, probably disordered eating, and low bone density. Okay, a 16-year-old female 
presents for evaluation of primary amenorrhea. History is unremarkable. Physical exam reveals a young woman who is at the 50th percentile for height and weight and 10 or 5 for breasts and pubic hair. External genitalia are normal, but attempts at performing a digital exam or introducing a Q-tip into the vagina are unsuccessful. The next step in the evaluation of this patient would be A, a progesterone challenge, B, an MRI of the head, C, ultrasound of the pelvis, or D, a testosterone level. And the answer is C, uh, ultrasound of the pelvis. So a testosterone level, if it was sky high, would probably would be suggestive of, um, oh, I'm blanking on the name, uh, testicular feminization syndrome. Um, whereas this young lady most likely has malarian agenesis and her testosterone level would be within normal limits. But the best test would be an ultrasound of the pelvis. Okay, and moving on to our final scenario, that's amenorrhea with hirsutism and otherwise normal pubertal development. So once again, a very busy slide will break it down. So you want to, again, obtain a good history and physical exam, start with a pregnancy test, followed by TSH and prolactin, um, and then you want to check some androgen levels, so free and total testosterone, a DHEAS, and 17-hydroxyprogesterone. And just so you know, you don't have to draw this first and then send the patient back to the lab for another um, blood draw. You know, in most cases, we don't. Um, I suppose if they were self-pay, you could, this would be the most cost-effective way, but practically speaking, we get them all at once. So, um, if her androgen levels were very high, so a high testosterone and a very high DHEAS, that would be suggestive of an androgen-secreting tumor. If her 17-hydroxyprogesterone level was significantly elevated, that would be suggestive of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, which is a 21-hydroxylase deficiency. Now, if these levels, particularly the DHAS and the free and total testosterone, were mildly elevated but not sky high, um, proceed with a progesterone challenge to see if you have withdrawal, if you obtain withdrawal bleeding. If so, then you are dealing with uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. So as you'll recall, with polycystic ovary syndrome, there are elevated levels of androgens, both free and total testosterone, and frequently the DHEAS may be mildly elevated as well. Um, if this young lady is obese, I would also consider getting a fasting glucose or a hemoglobin A1C or a two-hour glucose tolerance test. Um, we know that even weight loss, as little as um, you know, 5%, can, in some of these girls, um, help them to resume normal menses. Otherwise, um, these girls should be treated with oral contraceptive pills, or if they don't have a period, if you can give them two months. If they don't have a period on their own, then a course of Provera. What we want to avoid is unopposed estrogen stimulation that later in life can lead to uh, endometrial cancer. So, last question. A 17-year-old female presents with amenorrhea for six months. She has a history of infrequent menses since menarche at age 12. Her exam is remarkable for a BMI of 30 and mild hirsutism. Pregnancy test is negative. Labs, which included TSH, prolactin, DHAS, 17-hydroxyprogesterone, are all within normal limits. Her testosterone is mildly elevated. The next step in the management of this patient would be CT scan of the abdomen, a progesterone challenge, karyotype, or an estrogen and progesterone challenge. Okay, and the correct answer is a progesterone challenge. So 
it sounds like this girl probably has uh, polycystic ovary syndrome, it's not ovulating, therefore not producing progesterone. And this concludes my lecture. Um, I'll hang around afterwards if you have any questions, and I want to wish you all good luck on your boards.